Eight o'clock. All right. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, good evening. I see uh, people coming into our uh, artist talk on street photography, and we're going to um, do some introductions and welcome everyone momentarily. Um, and so for those of you who have already joined, thank you for joining so promptly. Uh, we're gonna wait just a moment or two and give some um, a few other people a chance to log on. Uh, and we'll begin momentarily. Thanks for being here. Are you supposed to sing us a little tune, uh, Jim and Dan? I'm sorry, John, say that one more time. I, I, are you going to sing us a little intro tune while we wait for everybody to turn up? You know, I was thinking about it, but I, he's really, he's, he's much better in the key, in the, in the key than I am. So <laughs> he's got a much better voice. <laughs> if you believe that. Exactly. If you believe that, you, we get a don't bridge want to, to sell I, I, I believe anything. I thought maybe you could start off with just like, Humming the girl from Ipanema or something or other. So yeah, you get a little waiting room music. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this is really terrific. I see more and more folks logging in. And um, this is great. So um, let's see, we can see some people, some, some of you, um, we can see uh, our screen does not allow us to see all of you all at once. Um, but <clears throat> let me just say, I'm very glad to see some familiar faces and names and also some new faces and names as well. So welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, the Leica Camera USA and Tamarkin Camera first artist talk of 2023. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, thank you for joining. I would like to take just a, a quick moment to introduce uh, ourselves. You may you may know me, but I would like to first introduce Mr. Jim Rice, who is our artist this evening. Um, James Rice uh, is based in Indiana and is a street photographer working almost exclusively with Leica cameras. He's based around Indianapolis, but travels a lot makes and takes his camera with him everywhere. Uh, and he's a good friend and happens to be in the same area of the Midwest that we are. So rather than doing everything on Zoom, Jim thought he would come and visit with us here in downtown Chicago. So we're thrilled to be side by side talking about Leica with you. So once again, for anyone who has just joined us, uh, my name is Dan Tamarkin. I'm your uh, host this evening for our first in our uh, series of artist talks. And we're gonna ask that uh, people mute themselves um, so that we're able, um, so that we're uninterrupted. Um, so that we can focus. So that we can focus. Yeah, because we both, we get very distracted easily very easily. That's right. Yeah. Um, so uh, once again, my name is Dan Tamark and I'm your host this evening. Uh, this artist talk is the first in our series of artist talks in 2023. And our first guest um, for, this, uh, for this year is Mr. James Rice, who is a street photographer using almost exclusively Leica cameras based in Indianapolis. Um, Jim has, uh, oh, let me do a couple more introductions too. On our call with all of you lovely people are also Mr. John Kreidler, who is a product specialist and our SL guru. 
He is going to be running the show this evening. He's the man behind the technology. And so if you folks would use the chat function in the Zoom window to ask questions, uh, we urge you to ask questions. Please introduce yourselves, feel free. The way that it will work is that you can ask a question and John Kreidler of Leica USA will relay it to me and will address it to you. That way we don't have windows popping up and, and everybody in all at once. So if you have asked a question and it hasn't been addressed, please be patient. We're gonna work our way through all of the questions and then and comments as well. And then of course, I've got some questions for Jim uh, about his photography. Also as a host and sponsor on today's call is Mr. Matt Butzow, who's a our rep, like a rep here in the Midwest. Um, and he's very, very knowledgeable about Leica and has helped to put all of this together for us. So I would like to extend a giant thank you to Leica Camera USA, to John Kreidler and to Matt as well for making this happen. Guys, thank you so much. It's great to have your support and uh, uh, especially on the technology behind um, this Zoom meeting that we're on tonight. So without further ado, let's begin. Um, meet Mr. James Rice, a good friend thank of mine, and welcome. Thank you. Well, I likewise would like to thank Dan and, and John as well. And there's a couple other folks at Leica that I would like to thank. Um, names you'll probably know. Uh, Tom Smith, who runs, I think, all the Leica Academy USA events, has just been a wonderful friend of mine for a long, long time. And, uh, and in Jim Wagner River, he happens to be, whether he's in New York City or wherever in the world, just one of the greatest like a VP human beings you could ever meet. So hello to, uh, to Tom and Jim as well. Right on. Yeah, the people at Leica are tremendously supportive of both Tamarkin and of uh, our clientele and our and our, all of our friends, which John, of which, of which Jim, what's your name? Jim. Jim. Of which Jim is one. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so I'm thrilled that we can sit here together. It's really nice that we can all get together. It's wonderful that we're all here on Zoom and the technology is terrific. But I got to say, it's just wonderful to have you in the room, man. It is. It's, it I is. missed you. So Jim takes a lot of street photography and he's published a few books. And so before we begin in uh, uh, the presentation, which you, I, I hope that you can all see on your screen, I just want to show you a couple of the books that Jim has produced. This is Second Look. I don't know if I'm doing this in order. But that's, that's correct. Second Look. And we'll see this photograph in our presentation. It's a beautifully printed book and it's a beautifully put together book as well. Um, uh, Jim also did a terrific book on Chicago Avenue here in Chicago. And this is an image that we'll see in tonight's presentation as well. And mm -hmm. as if that weren't enough, Jim and I traveled to Cuba uh, a few years ago, along with a mutual friend who happens to be in our studio audience with Complete Cuba, uh, who run bespoke uh, tours to Cuba that are really some of the very, very best off the beaten path and, and people to people fun times you can have uh, traveling in the Caribbean or Caribbean. Uh, and Jim made, you like that's a good one, huh? Uh, and Jim made this book, Real Cuba, which is terrific. So, that's a little bit about Mr. Jim Rice. Uh, let's uh, do a little housekeeping here. So please ask questions, use the chat function in your Zoom window and let's begin. This photograph we'll see a little bit later, uh, but I wanted just to, uh, to show this first because I thought it made an excellent cover image. Um, you can see photographer's knuckles there. You can see a little bit of interesting stuff in our reflections. And we've got this beautiful picture uh, that he made in a moment. And so one of the themes I think that we'll find in this evening's discussion is uh, indeed in a moment. What, what do you think about that title? Is that, is that something you came up with, right? It is. It is. You know, I think as human beings, it's easy for us to lose sight that we don't remember things that happened in a year uh, or a decade or whatever, we, we remember things that happened in a moment. And, and uh, it's, it's really important 
sometimes we can forget to live in a moment. We can forget to see in a moment. Uh, and as I got uh, more advanced in my photography journey, that's what I discovered was kind of missing in my life as well, is that I really wasn't living in the moment. I wasn't seeing in the moment. Once I realized how important that was, that had a huge impact both on my photography and on my life as well. So yeah, that's, an, that's where the title came from. It's interesting that the first picture would be color since I'm primarily a black and white photographer, but <laughs> that's okay. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot. There's, so we're going to start out with a bunch of black and white photographs. And what I'd like to do, if I may, is share with you a, a few of the contact informations for the people who are on this call, including Mr. Jim Rice. So let's take a look at that slide so that you, uh, we'll show it again later. So, uh, and we're happy to connect everybody here. So if any of you miss something in this presentation that you want to be reminded of, it will be mounted on YouTube later for us to review if you wish. And um, there's some contact information so that you can follow Jim, you can follow us, you can follow Leica. So let's begin with that. Please do ask questions, share um, during through the chat window. Feel free to post and to follow using these tags. And again, we'll show them later as well. And for anyone who misses them, um, we'll communicate with you after this event and we'll keep the lines of dialogue open. And so you'll have a chance to, to see these again. But with that, Let's take a look at some pictures. Yeah, yeah right on. We got a bunch of pictures that Jim made. And what we'd like to do is show you the photographs that we've chosen so that you can have a look through them. And then I will rewind this presentation and we can start talking about the individual images and where they came from, how Jim makes the images the gear that he uses. And some of, some of these photographs you may be familiar with because many of them were taken in Chicago. So some of them are part of different books that he's made or, or different projects, but many of these images were made in and around Chicago. And I gotta say, you know, about these images as we're just looking at them quickly for a moment. This was difficult for me because you got a lot of great images, man. It was hard to pick some stuff that was really, that was really excellent. What I think excellent imagery that also showcases Jim's style and the sorts of photographs that he takes. This is going to, this is the last photograph in our presentation. So bear with me as I back, go backwards and start at the beginning. So, so you're a Leica shooter. Yes. Tell, tell me about how did you get started before we talk about gear? Cause we're going to get to gear and you can ask any question you like about gear, about process, about photos, ask away. But before we start with gear, how did you find your way to photography to begin with? Tell me the story. Well, that goes back, uh, way back into the late 1950s. Um, I hate to say I'm that old, but that's how far back it goes. And everything was film. And even more than that, it was black and white film. My mother was very artsy, uh, loved photography, loved music. My dad was a civil engineer. Uh, and I wound up becoming a civil engineer and a photographer. Imagine how that could happen. <laughs> but uh, I was the firstborn in the family. And so my mother was always taking photographs of me with a Roloflex. She had kind of like a Vivian Meyer type, you know, uh, use a Roloflex all the time. And, and so tons of pictures laying around the house. Uh, 
by the time I was about five or six, I wanted to take pictures with the Rolleiflex, but that wasn't going to happen. So she got me my own camera. I think I tore up the first one, but then I wound up with uh, with one that kind of hung with me. And so from uh, age about age six to age nine, I was just blowing through black and white film like crazy. My mom did a great job of helping me understand things like composition and. She was very, very good at catching catching people. A really kind of a decisive moment when they were doing something quirky or funny or whatever, because that was just part of the way she was. So, um, and I would get on my bike. Um, so, picture this: you know, I'm, I'm about a six, seven year old kid. I've I've got my Aunt Linda's hand down twenty inch bike with big fat tires on it a basket on the front, streamers coming out of the handle <laughs> grips. Uh, you put baseball cards with clips in it in the spokes so it sounds like a motorcycle. I put my camera in the front basket of the bike and my normal attire <clears throat> would be a pair of jeans, no shirt, and I'd pull the jeans all the way up near my armpits and a pair of cowboy <laughs> boots and I would take off down the street. And I know the people in the neighborhood kind of thought that that kind of looks like Pee Wee Herman, maybe, you know, but that, that was kind of my look as I got out. So I had a great time. I'd ride all over the neighborhood, taking photographs, took a lot of photographs of the late 1950s cars in America that were so magical. Uh, and then I started taking pictures of just life in my little small town. It was really kind of like a, a Mayberry, actually. So then, then here's where the, the story kind of changes. So when I was nine, and this, this, is, this is kind of a rugged part, and we don't want to get hung up on that because the story ends good, but uh, I left the house to go to school one day, and when I did, um, a mentally ill man with a loaded shotgun walked into our house and killed my mother, shot my father, nearly killed him. And I wound up going to live with my grandparents. <clears throat> and so as a result of that, it was just in a moment, I felt like I had lost everything. And so I just walked away from photography, period. I just didn't, I didn't touch a camera for 40 years, 40 years. So at age 49, to kind of complete that story of, of how I got restarted in photography at age 49, I was kind of at an inflection point in my life. Um, and I, uh, a very good counselor suggested to me that maybe something I ought to think about doing would be to pick up a camera to maybe kind of reconnect with that, that little boy that kind of got lost in the shuffle of all that happened. So at age 49, I picked up a camera. It wasn't a Leica camera, it was by that time, 40 years later, basically nobody was using film, although film, as we all know, now is on a comeback. But so I got a DSLR and I had a, you know, I had a flagship DSLR with all the big zoom lenses and some prime lenses. And it had 10 million buttons on that flagship <laughs> DSLR. And I learned, I learned how to use every one of them. And I was making technically decent photos, but they really didn't have any soul to them. And I really wasn't feeling that same connection back to photography that I had felt when I got started originally. Yeah. So that's kind of that story in a nutshell. And so how did you find your way? How did you find, after picking up the, it was, it was a Nikon. Yeah, it was. Um, and D3. that's okay. Any, a, a, all cameras yeah. are good cameras. Yeah, yeah. Best camera in the world. This is the camera you have with you. Our studio audience is booing me for saying that. Yeah. But um, how, so, how did you find your way to like it? So, <clears throat> one night I was had my iPad. I was sitting in bed looking at YouTube videos, and out of nowhere, the, this video comes on about a photographer named Craig Sametko, who I had no idea who Craig Sametko was. So I watched the YouTube video and, and Craig is using a Leica M9 camera with a 35 and a 50 millimeter lens. And he starts talking about Henri Cartier-Bresson and who his inspirations were in photography. And I'm watching 
this guy walk around swinging this little little like M9 that I at the time knew virtually nothing about. And I just could not get that out of my head. And so in the ensuing days, I started reading about Leica cameras. I started, it, it became apparent to me that some of the greatest photographers in, in the history of photography, going back to before I was even born, used Leica cameras. And I started looking at the type of pictures that Craig was making, that, that the giants, uh, uh, the masters of photography were making. And it, they reminded me of the pictures that my mother had taken when I was a little kid. I thought, holy smokes. So I packaged up my Nikon D3S, all my zoom lenses, all my prime lenses. You know, I need to, needed to have a cart to roll them in. <laughs> yeah. and, and I traded them all in. And I thought, boy, I'll be able to get some nice like equipment. But <laughs> when I traded all that stuff in, I was able to get one Leica M9 and a used 50 Summicron uh, lens version five. And I looked at those and I thought, wow. But I, I took off, that's how I got back to Leica. I, I, I did it for no more of a reason than that. Uh, now buying, just buying a Leica camera is not gonna make you a good photographer yeah. at all. But what I did find, uh, first of all, I could take that thing with me everywhere. It was so compact, it was so small. Uh, and for some reason having, uh, this is kind of about like it now, this is my M6 with a 50 millimeter Summicron, but that little camera, the range finder uh, with the little manual focus lens, it just connected to my brain. It was a, it was a slower process in taking photos. But all of a sudden, I felt like that little kid again, mm -hmm. and, and and that's that's how I got my start in Leica. That's awesome. Yeah, I well, love it. it, was, it was, I love it. No, and the idea of I mean, I don't know that we really have time to dive into it tonight, but the idea of art as healing is a very powerful and real thing. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I would like to talk about that, but I we want I want to talk about your photography for I don't know if we have time. To get into everything tonight but uh david your question was perfectly timed uh because we were about to talk about how jim found his way to like it to begin with and then we once we met we became friends and so now you know we, he's he's got his uh uh he's got his like a man in his corner um uh we want to we're we, i also see jim and tom's questions as well and we want to get to those. So do you actually, since you just showed your camera, let's talk about Jim's question. Jim asks, what's your favorite lens and do you use filters for black and white? Okay, good question. So as, as Dan can attest, uh, I, I, you know, at one time or another, I've probably owned almost, uh, well, I, I, I've owned a lot of M cameras, the Qs and SLs, which will, if you're a non-photographer, that won't mean anything to you. And some of you are non-photographers and watching just to, to see if I'm going to fall on my face. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're here. But for all these photographers, you'll know what I'm talking about there. Uh, and almost and a myriad of, of lenses. Uh, just because that's kind of part of the process as an artist. You, it, it, it takes a while to, to find your voice, to, to find your style, and then to find what tool works best for you uh, in being able to create your art and to, to express your voice and, and, and your style. Uh, and and it, for me, it wound up becoming M's. And, and so uh, the, the two M's that I have now are an M11 and an M6 TTL. Of course, the M11 is digital, <clears throat> the, the newest M. The M6 TTL is film. Uh, because there's something, I mean, that's, I started in, in film. And so to, to have a film camera is just really, really special to me. Um, and then in terms of lenses, you know, focal length is, is a huge part of, as you begin to find how you work and, and, and what you want to do, uh, that impacts the, and, and I went through a ton of different focal lengths and, and where I've landed is basically uh, 28 millimeter and 50 millimeter. 
um, with a with a 90 millimeter tapped in there now for uh, some special use. But um, when I'm doing street photography, and I've spent about 15 years on the streets in Chicago, uh, and Chicago has become like a second home to me. Really, I've got wonderful friends up here, and there's it's kind of ironic. I grew up in you know a little bitty small town uh, that felt like home to me, but but when I, I really got my legs in photography again, it wasn't back in my small hometown. It was in Chicago of all places, which is <laughs> really interesting. But I can tell you why that is, I think. So a lot of my, uh, and I'm getting sidetracked off the, the 2850, but I'll come back to that. But, I'm going to keep you honest. But uh, uh, a lot of my work is, I think, connected to my subconscious. Uh, and, and I think many artists would, would express that that same thought and what you'll notice in a lot of my work is that that it's kind of, in a sense it's kind of timeless if you look in the frame it's hard to identify whether that picture was made in 2021 or whether it was made in 1958 or 1959 and I think when I picked back up in photography and I and I really uh, discovered that that my work is all about the moments and and, and finding a moment that people can relate to and yet when it's got kind of something magical about that moment uh, but then having it in a background that kind of looks and feels like it did back in the late 50s that really resonates with me and there are places in Chicago where I can go and I look around in the environment and it feels like I'm back in the late 50s and when it does that, it just triggers my subconscious and I can make my best work in that, in that setting. So I got a little off track there, but basically 28 and 50 and in street photography, it's pretty much the, when I'm working close and you'll see in a lot of my pictures, uh, I'm working, I'm working close. Uh, it's, it's a 28 millimeter Sumicron that I've got on there. I also have a 28 millimeter Sumeron the little pancake lens, which I love that, that lens. So those are the two 28s I use. And finally, I've migrated on my 50 back to uh, a 50 Summicron version five. Uh, and and I've, I've had a bunch of other 50s, but the, the Summicrons kind of have their own uh, character, uh, particularly the non-spherical 50 millimeter and that kind of resonates with the kind of work that I do so those are the lenses and, and cameras and you're not really a big filter guy right like most of the stuff that you're shooting like I mean obviously this picture that we're all looking at now is not anachronistic and it is a modern photograph but um in part of um Jim's question is do you are do you use filters for your black and white when I use when I'm shooting black and white film on the M6 TTL, it's typically Tri-X, uh, or sometimes I use uh, Ilford uh, FP4 Plus. Uh, I also shoot some CineStill film, which is really kind of neat. Uh, I'll put an orange filter on on the on the lens yes. when I do that. Mostly when I use that little Sumeron, the, the the 28 millimeter Sumeron pancake, I'll put a little orange filter on there, which which kind of you know increases the contrast a little bit. Yep. And, yeah, but but when I shoot with the M11, I, I don't use any filters. Yeah. yeah, the colors on the M11 are absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, and Tom, I see your question as well, but yay, Julia's here. That's great. We Last year, we, we missed each other. And so I'm glad to see you, uh, Julia, that you're here. Um, Jim, do you shoot black and white or color and convert? No, but let okay. me interject. Okay. I got to interject. All right. Because like, we both own monochrome cameras yes. and a lot of what you're going to see tonight i'm going to like answer this question for you oh, some of these not all of these photographs were made on the cameras that he t currently has so right. like for a while right. you shot with a monochrome camera when you were shooting almost completely black and white I did. so i had the monochrome i had the m246 i also had the m10 monochrome and i had a q2 monochrome uh, and they're all great cameras i i, I never I never had a like a camera or lens that I didn't like. Okay. <laughs> but I, I've got to say, I, I we'll talk about like academies a little bit later, but my dear, dear friend, Arthur Myerson, I, I took a like academy class with him 
on shooting in color, which was a which was a scary thing for me because I I, I basically when I am photographing I see in black and white. That might not make sense to people because reality is in color, but but when I'm out there, I basically see in black and white. That's just the way my brain works. And so I took the Like Academy class with Arthur Meyerson, and and he really, I, I mean, he really challenged me to shoot in color. And and so to answer the question about the the M11 came out, and and the, the color in it is so spectacular. And and once Arthur uh, encouraged me to spread my wings a little bit. Uh, then I didn't want to have a monochrome camera in my hand and miss a really important color shot that came along. And and by this, in the same way, I could take a frame from the M11 that's on a color sensor and convert it to black and white and compare it to my other monochrome images. And I could hardly tell the difference between the two. This is the part of the question that Julia yeah. was asking is whether or not you, you're converting. Um, and so the, the uh, part of the answer, I think, Julia, is that now with the M11, M11 because it's 60 megapixel and Pickle. yeah, me megapixel, megapixel, megapixel. megapixel. Yeah. No, that's a megapixel. It's a very specific, yeah. highly technical term because you got 60 <laughs> megapixel to work with and you have all this high ISO capability that you found more recently that the M11 color conversions are giving you what you would get with the it, monochrome. It, it, it does, it, and, it, you know, to, to my eye, it does. And, uh, you know, just, I, I just didn't want to carry a monochrome camera and have that great color shot that comes along. And I knew Arthur would be mad at me for the rest of his <laughs> life because I didn't get that shot. So, so, but, but if, if I do, and there is something cool about having a monochrome camera though, uh, if I want to do that, I just put black and white film in my M6 TTL and I'm shooting a black and white camera. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, these these cameras are really small. I mean, compared to a lot of other cameras, it's really very compact. So for those of you who are not photographers and maybe don't know exactly what we're talking about, this is a Leica M camera and it's a rangefinder camera. So you look through this window, it's all manual. There's very little automatic about it. Anyway, that, so I just wanted to show what we are talking about. We talk about these little cameras and why they're so valuable uh, uh, to street photographers uh, in particular. So with that, can we talk about this handsome gentleman yeah, on the yeah. Vespa or whatever yeah, it was? Yeah. How did you make that picture? Tell me about that moment. Well, you know what? I like people. And if you're going to be a street photographer, you really should like people and you should like life and it should be every day when you get up if you know that should inspire you if, if if you know if you're not always looking and you don't like people and life's <laughs> a drag you probably shouldn't be a street photographer so you know part of the joy for me has been the people that I've met over the course of the last 15 years and and you know, I believe with all my heart that people in the world are much better than you would think the world is if you watch <laughs> the news on a regular basis, because you watch the news on a regular basis, you think everything's terrible. <laughs> well, it's really not. Uh, in this particular photograph, uh, it was it was late, late in the afternoon, and uh, there, there's my, my best photographs, there's something that the minute I see that, that, that opportunity starting to develop it just my subconscious starts to scream out it could be something very small but uh, th this guy came wheeling up on on this scooter I, I had a little scooter like this one time and so the scooter catches my eye then I realize he's he's got a Gucci bag hanging you know over his shoulder and then those those great glasses that he's got on and he's just so happy and and I'm almost you know, back in time, thinking about that little boy I just described to you on his Pee Wee Herman bike <laughs> riding down the street with a big smile. <laughs> right. and so there was the picture for me. You know? Yeah. And yeah. That's did you zone focus or did you take time in this instant, in this moment to focus on the gentleman? You know, I had, I did most of my work. I, I like it to be 
as, as candid as it can be because you, you're yeah. getting a genuine. I, I don't pose people typically. Yeah. I, I want that that special candid moment, but he came up and we chatted a little bit and, and so I noticed his Gucci bag and so I did. I, I don't think this was zone focused that I actually took my time. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. But that's something you do. Barbara asked a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, one about color conversions. I we I don't know if we see eye to eye on the color conversion thing, but Barbara, to answer your question about zone focusing, you do a lot of zone Big focusing, time. don't you? Yeah. So zone focusing is, uh, you know, if you, if you don't have a range finder and, and you don't shoot all manual, you probably don't even know what zone focusing means, but 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 that the ability to to use zone focus when you're using a rangefinder camera will allow you to 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 make photographs that you couldn't make any other way. When you look at some we'll see tonight, you almost become invisible to the people you're taking the photograph with. You can get so close, uh, and and you you, you inst by zone focusing, you can set on the camera and say everything from three feet to 30 feet is going to be in focus. So all you've got to know is whether you're within between three feet and 30 feet and everything is going to be in focus. It works best with a wider lens, which is why I went to the 28 yeah. millimeter lens. It, it's very difficult to zone focus on a 50 millimeter lens. So I basically just do that on the 25 or the 28. Yeah. Uh, but I found the 28 to, to have a big difference, even to the 35 millimeter lens when it comes to zone focusing. So zone yeah. focusing is a big deal. Wider angle lenses typically have greater depth of field at the same aperture. So when using a 28 at F4, you're going to have more depth of focus or depth of field, as people like to say, than you will with a 50 at the same aperture. It's yeah. just the way optics yeah. work. Yeah. Um, I So I, I left... Barbara's question hanging about whether or not color conversions are better or which we like better than the monochrome. I think that the monochrome images are better than, than color conversions, but you've been doing a lot of color converting lately with the new M11, yeah. which is something I have not. So Jim has a lot of experience in this and I have virtually none. Um, what do you think about those color conversions? Like, are you missing your monochrome? Nope. Nope. That's, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, love I, I think the M11 is a, just a, a couple of things. The, the M11 having the 60 megapixel, 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 mega, megapixel sensor. Uh, we're going to have everybody saying megapixel. Yeah, I hope so. Megapixel. I hope so. The 60 megapixel sensor does allow you to crop a little bit if you need to. Now, you know, a lot of the masters in photography, you know, will say, I, you know, Henri Cartier-Bresson or uh, Costa Manos will say, I, I never crop a photo. Uh, I try not to crop a photo a lot, um, but sometimes I do crop a little bit because I, I, would, I, I would really rather see a nice photo that doesn't have something that takes your attention away on the edge. So the, 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 the bigger sensor uh, allows you to do that a little bit. Uh, and then the hybrid shutter is a big deal, I think, on, on the M11 because it allows you to go beyond the one four thousandth of a second if you need it and kind of eliminates the need for having to use filters. And um, But the, the, the color on it's spectacular. And like I say, I, you know, if I didn't, if Arthur had not got me starting to think about shooting in color, I'd probably still have a monochrome, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> So I blame it on Arthur. We're yeah, well, Arthur. we can blame it on Arthur. That's fine. Um, uh, there's If you get a chance to take a Leica Academy, by the way, with really any of their artists, please do it. But in particular, the two artists that we mentioned this evening, um, Craig Semeco and Arthur Meyerson, both do terrific programs. So if you get the opportunity, definitely check them out. Are you a... Are you a sit and wait photographer? Or, are you, or do you always you keep moving... Do I, Constantly. Do, do I stalk my Do you stalk or, or do you do sit, I sit and, wait? and wait for him to show up? You, you know, there, I, I don't use any one formula in regard to that. Uh, anybody that's spent time on the street, you, you kind of realize um, every day is different and every situation can be different. Uh, some days it's it's like a it's like a conveyor belt just coming at you. There's just so many good things. Other days. 
it's slow as can be and nothing seems to come your way. So I, you know, I really just, I, I take what's given to me out there on the street and make the most of it. There are times I, you, you know, you see something that you'll see a character or uh, it's the anticipation that you get. At, when you become an experienced street photographer, it, it isn't just about, uh, you know, occasionally catching a moment. It, it is about being able as much to anticipate when a moment is going to happen before it happens and you get ready ahead of time. I, I mean, that's that's how you kind of become invisible because you see something that you think is going to, it doesn't always work out that way, hmm. but you have to have that anticipation. Um, and that's, that's part of, I've always loved people. I've loved life. Uh, I've been very observant of, of how, uh, of body language, of what people do. All those are, I think, key components to, to really being able to find those moments when they do happen. Um, so, so, you know, there, there's times, um, you know, you follow a potential person around for a scene to happen, but uh, there are also times when I've just found a good background or a foreground and waited for somebody to come into that space yeah, as yeah. well and made a photograph that way. Uh, Barbara, Barbara said something very funny. She says that Mega Pickle, Mega Pickle goes well with pastrami, which I, I, <laughs> I love that. I think it's hilarious. Now, I'm... There's a lot, you could fill an ocean with what I don't know. And this include you like that? This includes the hybrid shutter. So Barbara's asking what, what is a hybrid shutter? Yeah, you're the Leica X. I'm I know, I should know this kind of thing. You're, you're I Dan should know this kind of thing. Mark and so Cameron, I don't, you're wanting me to talk about I know. the hybrid. Because you know there are probably 50 people that are watching this that know more about a hybrid shutter than you or I. I know, either. that's so, why I'm afraid so to answer the question. Me I was <laughs> So basically the idea is that the shutter is measured in thousandth of a second and the typical shutter that opens and closes in the such a small mechanism, it, it can only go up to about four thousandth of a second. With the new M11, because the sensor is always viewing and metering the scene, we can shoot at much, much, much higher shutter speeds, but only um, in, in, in the environment of having the shutter be an electric oh, shutter, an electronic as shutter, to mechanical as shutter, opposed to yeah. the mechanical shutter, which actually opens and closes. Right. And so the extended shutter on the M11 and on other cameras is an electronically controlled um, capture that allows you to use much, much, much faster shutter speeds. Bingo. I hope that that answers your question. But if you want more clarity, I will uh, send me an email and I will do some reading. I'll bone up. I'll, I'll do a little I'll do a little research now. I, we have uh, our friend Gary, who's a local photographer, is asking a terrific question. It's a big question. And I want to ask the question so that we have it in our minds, because I think it's going to take time to answer it. The question is, do you find yourself completing ideas from the past? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's a big question. It's a huge, it's a huge question. And there's a couple of different ways, like uh, ideas from the past that you've had where you've made a photograph and you want to maybe follow it up or expound on it create a project around a photograph that you've made, or this could also be read as building on things that other people have done. And so one of the things that we want to talk about, we were going to talk about some of these photographs because I, I feel bad you guys are sitting here looking at this one photograph. We want to go through some more of this stuff. Yeah. But, you know, today is a, a 102nd birthday of Ernst Haas. Yes. Who's yes. a terrific color photographer. Yes. Ernst er, er, and, Toss and, and Saul Leiter and Arthur Meyerson are probably the three photographers who have influenced me most in, in using color. Uh, and, you know, that, that question kind of begs, begs to me something that maybe I'm, I'm off base here. Yeah. But, but one of the, uh, Elliot Irwin at one time was asked in an interview what, advice he would give to aspiring photographers <laughs> and his response was something like don't quit your day job okay <laughs> so one one of the nice things about the way things worked out in life for me was that engineering which kind of came from my dad a allowed me to earn a living and then photography that came from my mother uh, allowed me to to express my artistic side but um, 
because I had both of those, I, I wasn't starving to death trying to be a photographer, <laughs> which can really, in, I think, impinge upon your work. And, and so the fact that I have never earned my living as a photographer, I think has freed me up uh, artistically to, to do and try things that, that some photographers that are trying to earn a living with their craft won't do because yeah. they can't take that risk because yeah. they need to put food. You got to produce. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so when you ask the question about do photographs that you take, do, do you re read the question? Uh, Gary's asking, do you find yourself completing ideas from the past? So I think where I connect to that is that there are a lot of things that, that I have thought about doing that, that I didn't do, but the inspiration that I would get from, I, I've attended a five or six like Academy events. Every time I'm inspired by the people that teach it, I'm inspired by the other students that are there and, and I'll take notes. I'm, a, I'm an avid note taker and there have been notes that I have made that I have come back to later and decided um, I'm going to try to do this, or I'm going to try to do that just because I can. Now, I do think it's important. I've tried to create uh, a style that's recognizable. And, and I, I feel like uh, the point of where you, you shift from being a hobbyist photographer to, to being an artist is, is where there is a connection with what you are inside as mm. a human being that comes out in the work that you do. And so you, you don't want to, I don't think you want to do so many things that you lose that connection. And so what I do try, I'm, I'm careful to make sure that, that it's, it's authentic, I, I guess, that it, that it really resonates yeah. with who I am. And, and I think you see that in, you, you can see work that is really not authentic. It's just, anybody can take a, you know, a great camera out on the street and point it, you know, on the street and click the shutter, but that doesn't make a great photograph. Um, you, you know, a great photograph. It's a moment, but it. not an interesting one. Right. Perhaps. Right. Yeah. Right. So, anyway. um, uh, I'm Tim, I'm, I'm thrilled to see you here. Um, Tim is a, a friend, old friend of our, well, he's not old, he's a young man, but we're, old friends from back in Connecticut from when our story was in the Connecticut days. And Tim asks about when you choose, when do you choose digital versus film? But before you answer that, tell me about this picture that we're looking at. Okay. Where was this made? And I guess I'm curious, did you stalk? Tell me the story behind this photograph. So, How'd so, you make it? So this is an Indiana Golden Gloves bout. Um, and it was, was really neat. Uh, I was able to get, as you can tell, access right up to, to ringside when I made this photograph. And I talked to this little fella before, before the match, and, and he, said, uh, he said, I'm going to be the next Muhammad Ali, uh, which kind of resonated with me because when I was a little boy, uh, I lived an hour or so north of Louisville where Ali you know, made his name. So I can remember hearing and watching uh, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali fight uh, from the very beginning. And so this little kid says to me, I'm going to be the next Muhammad Ali. So uh, I waited for his bout and he got in there and he was, he was boxing against a, a kid that was a, a head and a half taller than <laughs> him. And this little kid just ate him up. I mean, he just <laughs> tore the guy up. And so I, I moved in to take the photograph and I, I took this with a, I think a 50 millimeter Sumalux and, and probably the uh, M246. Uh, and as I moved in to take the photograph, he, he, he caught, he, he saw me out of the corner of his eye and he turned his head and I made that picture. And as right after I'd made that picture, he said to me, I told you I was going to be as good as Ali. <laughs> so that's kind of the story. All right, most of the stuff that we're going to see tonight, these are digital images. Is there anything that we that you no, shot on film in, in this either. presentation? No. Um, so how do you choose whether you're going to shoot digital or film? Because you carry both I cameras. Carry, I, I, I carry both. You know, if I, if I have uh, my film camera, it typically has black and white film in it and so 
uh, I'm looking for high contrast situations that, uh, so if, if, if I'm in a, an area where I do have those kind of backgrounds and the high yeah. contrast and then I, and more and more I go to film, but you, you know, film's a lot more expensive. Than, than I know. Digital. Isn't it crazy how it's turned, it's kind of turned around. So do you ever have a moment where you take a picture with a camera and you're like, oh wait, that's the film camera. Let me get the other one. Do you ever have, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. ever have that moment? Yeah. 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 I, do. I I will given an, given the opportunity I will take forty five minutes to pack my camera bag because I can never decide what to bring and what not to bring. But he's got it down. He's got the M six with a fifty. I hope you don't mind. I'm just picking yeah. up your stuff. M six with a fifty and the M eleven with the twenty eight. And again, like the other one that I showed off earlier, this is a digital camera. This is a film camera. You can see that they're very similar in size and shape. And, uh, and they're really, really terrific tools. So for those of you who are not familiar with Leica cameras, I just wanted to introduce that because we know that the room is full of Leica and non-Leica people. Um, Tim is a digital and film shooter. I think he's shooting digitally now, but also really likes the M6 and M2. We're both, we're both M2 fans. Tim, I'm thrilled to see you here. Thank you all for being here. This is terrific. Don't be shy. Tap away into that, into that chat. Uh, area and feel free to ask us some more questions. But I want to I want to show off all of your photographs and I want to hear what you have to say about them. Who is this? Well, th this is my uh, step granddaughter, and you can say what you said about that photograph earlier. I'm gonna, you said it very elegant. I'm gonna I'm gonna quote. I don't remember who it is, so I'm not really gonna quote them. But I want to give two people credit for having said a thing. It is either the wise and handsome Craig Simetko or the wily and handsome Tom Smith that said, don't take pictures of children, take pictures of childhood. I think it was, I think it was Craig that said this yeah. and it's terrific advice. Um, and, but now he's going to give you a lot of other advice too. So I'm not giving away the farm when I say this, but this is really some of the best advice I ever got. Yeah. Take pictures of, of childhood, not, not just of children. Anybody can take a picture of a child, of childhood and the same thing he used the example of mothers you know don't just yeah, take a picture yeah. of, a picture of a mother take a picture of motherhood and get the essence of the thing and part of that i think is can be seen or gleaned from your title in a moment and there is something about this idea of capturing the decisive moment and and the idea of the moment it's just important to understand that yeah. some moments are interesting and some moments are not i think i mean but it's a very subjective thing I think this is a terrific moment. We all know what it's like to eat an ice cream cone. And I just kind of wonder how much ice cream is actually on her fingers. Whose sunglasses is she wearing? Um, I just, I got lots of questions about this because it is a, mo a child, a moment of childhood that we all know. Well, Allie is a styler. She is. She's, she's always styling, but you know, it's the, it's the, oversized sunglasses it's that ice cream cone buried in your mouth it's your ears rolled over it yeah it, it, it just it it speaks volumes of childhood and, that, and that's why folks always have a camera with you i mean you've you got gotta to always have a camera with even you. if the, even if this is your camera no judges right. no judges right. it doesn't matter right. i mean i made some some of my favorite photographs i made because either i was out of film which i should never be or uh, I didn't have my camera with me, which should never happen. So I use my phone a lot. I'll admit it. Um, uh, I love this picture. I think it's terrific. Again, I had a hard time picking picking photographs because you've got so many so much great stuff. But one of the things that I look for in my own photographs and in curating uh, um, an event like this or curating in the gallery is we want to make sure that every photograph is telling its own story. And so I did not include a couple of other terrific photographs that you made uh, of childhood I, I i have seven grandkids so plenty of so plenty of opportunity right. yeah not so easy with a manual focus camera but right. he's he's really rising to the occasion let's see what's next this is from the chicago avenue series and is actually the cover of jim's yeah. book this is a yeah. terrific photograph yeah. what did you how did you make this was this a a uh, serendipitous moment or did you stalk actually this not this was part of a this photograph was made as a part of a Leica Academy event and I was actually getting 
coached by Nick Pinto, who led that particular like Academy event. Terrific photographer. And I was, uh, it was part of my learning to get closer. Yeah. Now, listen, for me, uh, there, there's a balance that I try to strike. I don't, I don't ever on the street want to make somebody feel uncomfortable. I don't yeah. want to ever make anybody feel embarrassed. Um, and, and I, and I want my, you know, I want the photographs I take to, to at least be respectful of, of, of people. Not you may have a funny moment, but I don't want to disrespect anyone. And, and I, I don't think this guy ever saw me take that photo, but I, I'm, I'm careful in that regard. But there, there are times, you know, that you need to be close mm -hmm. and, and you need to have somebody help you learn how to get close with, without, uh, you know, without impinging upon the rights of the people you're photographing. That's an important part. I agree. I see it the same way. But, but the Chicago Avenue work for me, um, you know, just the name I, the, the Chicago came to mean so much to me. And then here, so, so you got a major street that's called Chicago mm -hmm. Avenue. We had, we had a neat event where we spent a bunch of time out in West Town, uh, which is where a lot of the photographs in my Chicago Avenue book uh, originate. Um, but I, I thought it'd be neat to just document life along Chicago Avenue. And I'm still doing that to this very day. So yeah. there might be a volume two or, or whatever. <laughs> that comes I hope out. so. Also, there were, in curating a lot of your photographs, I realized that I had chosen a big section of them that were from the Chicago work. And we wanted to show a greater breadth of work. Yeah. This happens to also be uh, up Chicago Avenue. It is. That's West Town. But this is, I mean... I think this is great. I love it. I mean, I love, it's like we, you had said earlier, we were talking, we've been hanging around all day, talking together, talking about photography. Because it's what we do. Because it's what we do. And there, you, you, there, you said something, this is, this photograph is anachronistic. You can't really tell what the time frame is. I mean, yeah. you know, things like these old style horsey things have been around for a while. Um, needless to say, cowboy hats and cowboy gear have been around for a while. And of course, children. So um, it's a terrific moment. And this was, I'm going to guess, because we have some, not everything is tack sharp, that it was probably just a moment you saw raise the camera up. It, and it was. And play. so yeah. this was one of those moments that instantaneously, I think, connected to my subconscious because when I was a little kid, we had a, we had a, uh, a store called G.C. Murphy in Seymour, Indiana that had a mechanical horse like this right in front of us. So I, I rode that horse all the time. Um, and so when I saw this, when I was passing by and I, I saw this horse and I, and when the little boy's eyes just made direct contact with me, it was like, I was seeing a piece of me. And, yeah. and I immediately noticed that it, that that's a timeless frame right there. You, you really, again, that, that's my best photographs, I think, when, when my subconscious is in, in gear and I'm seeing like I want to see uh, a lot of those frames, you can't tell whether they were shot in the late 50s or whether they were shot now. And that's, you know, that's that's very important. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that has to do with your style and your vision and and just your your voice. Um and, you know, when we were when in, in hanging around and talking about the moment, in a moment, of the moment, the decisive moment, which all moments are decisive in my estimation, but without getting, opening that can of worms, um, not every photograph has to be tack sharp. No, it doesn't. It does, right? Right. And it's a question of the moment. So we have this child's eyes. I think that if we had this level of, a blur and not the child's eyes, it might not work quite as well. But I wanna show you just for a moment, um, The Americans, which is a very well regarded, highly regarded uh, book by Robert Frank. And here we have a photograph, it's not anywhere near sharp, but you get an idea of what it's all about. This is about Jim, so I don't wanna show off all these photographs, but I just wanna give you an idea of how so many famous photographs, they don't have to be sharp, it's the moment. Yeah, it's Jim, the moment, it's the moment. Jim likes being 
his photographs being compared to Robert. Yeah, Frank's. it's not That's too bad, man. Right. Yeah, it'll be all right with that. Um, so uh, I and you know he, <laughs> this uh, John just wrote me. Uh, uh, Tom says Tom asked you're talking about getting close. Robert Kappa said if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. I tell my students that all the time. You're right. That's exactly right. Don't be shy about getting closer. And I'll tell you that for as type A a person as I am, I'm very shy about getting close to people. Yeah. And I like being a little bit removed. I don't want to disturb that, that scene. And I also don't want to get too close just because I'm kind of shy. But this is a really good example, I think, of, of seeing a moment and making, getting getting it on film or digital as the case. And I love be. that the guy, the cowboy that's going in is one, he's taking a look at the boy on the horse and you can see the motion that he's got. There's just, you know, there, you can look at that. And I think uh, in my best work, if people look at the frame, they can create their own stories. That's about right. What's going that's on right. in that, which is really cool because everybody might have a different story or a different feeling. That's right. But but it's not an emotionless picture. I, I want, you know, I want my best work to touch people's emotions. I want them to. Yeah. I want them to want to look at it longer than. <laughs> yeah, they're just swiping through it. Well, and I also in my just in my own brain, I I imagine that this gentleman is looking at that young boy and thinking to himself the same thing that you thought and said, gee, I remember riding that horse. Now I he's look, thinking, what do, I a lot a, of do I have a quarter in my pockets? So oh, I'm that's even better. Do so I have a quarter that I can give to the kid? No, so I can get on. Oh, so I can ride the <laughs> I wonder, you have to be this tall to ride the ride, right? Well, that's no problem. That's no problem. Brain. No problem for either no, of us. No, no. So again, I, I want to go back. I don't want to give Tim, uh, Tim's question short shrift. A lot of what we're seeing here tonight, Tim, are digital images, but but you're you've gotten back into film and so there's a lot there'll be more there, film coming. there's more film but oh, you, yeah. do you but you you maybe you're i don't want to put words in your mouth but my guess is that you're not you're choosing to shoot film versus digital by virtue of the cameras that you carry and if you know that you want it to be black and white you pick up your film camera so pre-pandemic i used to carry two two M's with me. I would have one with a 28 millimeter lens on it, one with a 50 millimeter lens. So if a scene developed that I needed to have the 50 on, for instance, I had it there. So I would just reach down and grab yeah, it yeah. And, and use it. Um, you know, post pandemic, uh, things have changed so much on the street. I mean, we all know how things have changed post pandemic in terms of what it's done to people and culture and so on uh, and and you sense that on on the street a little bit uh, even to the point of where there are a lot of times i don't feel comfortable having two cameras hanging on my shoulder when i'm out walking around on the street so I, likewise i, I, I kind of don't do that as much anymore but if it gets to the point i mean occasionally i do to today i i was taking photographs in a very chilly chicago day and, and i had was in a place where I had both of them out. I've got I had a 28 on one, a 50 on the other, and I've got no hesitance, hesitance, hesitancy in shooting film. Um, and so I'll probably shoot more of that now that I've just got you know I've kind of pared down to these two ends. I think I'll find myself shooting more film. You you did an admirable job of paring down. Yeah, I did. I did. You I did, did an admirable job of paring down. I know because I was the beneficiary of, of his paring down. I, I was going to keep your monochrome camera because I figure you'll be famous one day and I'll put it on eBay That's for a right. million dollars. Yeah. This picture that we're looking at now, this was picked by LFI, like a photography international, which is a long running um, uh, publication of the Leica camera company based in right. Germany. Um, it's a terrific photograph. That was a... Uh... That was a master shot, I think, and wound up being their picture of the week. So it got printed in the hard copy. Hey, yeah, LM. it did. It did. It did. Yeah, and that was shot oh, on an M9. So that was that was uh, my very first uh, digital range finder, and with a 50 millimeter uh, Summicron version five. Uh, there was a wedding going on, and these guys were the groomsmen. Uh, and they were bored out of their Yeah, way. they look in, absolutely enthralled they, they by were, whatever they're waiting right. for. And so I'd been uh, looking at their expressions on their face. And, you know, uh, again, in one of the Like Academy, Richard Bram taught a Like Academy course, and we really focused on emotion and gesture. Mm -hmm. you know? This is a very 
if you'll pardon me saying this way, a very Brammy photo. Yeah, it's a, it's a Brammy photo. Yeah, he's a terrific photographer too. I want to keep, don't be shy about asking questions. We're going to keep moving. So I love uh, this. So yeah, this was taken in a neighborhood called Sobro, which is South Broad Ripple, which is just um, south of where I live in Carmel, Indiana. Uh, and I was walking the streets, taking photographs, and I stopped at a, a local bar there to, to, to have a cocktail, and this guy comes along. And Tell me what he told what he told you. Yeah. So so we started chatting and uh, discovered that he and I were both high rise construction workers back in the early seventies in Indianapolis for a period of time and could have bumped into one another and so we talked about that and um, he noticed my camera and he said, "Well, obviously you, you take pictures." And I said, "Yeah, and I'm a photographer." And he he looks at me with with a dead serious expression and he said nobody would want to take my picture and I said that's not true and he said well even if you did nobody would want to look at it and I said that's not true and so <laughs> I, I took that picture and that's that's with a 28 millimeter lens um, I, I could see all the reflections in the window behind but he had such a tender uh, look in his eyes and he just you know you could just sense that this guy was so down on himself that he didn't believe anybody would want to take his picture mm. and I took that and I said look uh, someday a lot of people will see that picture <laughs> today's that today's and one of those days day. yeah and you yeah. got real you must have been real close to take this picture because even with the 28 I can I, I get the impression that you were probably you I know pretty close. close to him yeah yeah. Pretty close to him. Well, <clears throat> that's a, this is about my favorite photograph that, that I've ever made. Um, I, I told Dan earlier today, this kind of reminds me of a Costa Manos uh, photograph when he did some great work in Defusky Island, actually back in my birth year of 1952. Um, th this is, there's an interesting, normally in walking along the street like this, I would be zone focusing. And you can obviously tell uh, this is not a zone focused photograph. Uh, it was getting near the end of the day. Uh, I had just taken a photograph and opened my aperture up to F2 uh, and, and got the exposure right. And then before I made the shot and then before I took off walking along the street, I didn't move it back to F11 like I typically would <laughs> and get everything set up for a zone focused shot. It was just, I was tired. It was the end of the day. And that, you know, when it's, you're tired and it's the end of the day, you know, a lot of times that's when the greatest opportunity can, can present itself. And I, and I saw this coming down the street. And so I, I knew the only thing I could do, I, I, I just literally set, set my focal distance to, to be six feet. So I, I just went to my distance scale on left it set at F2, set it at six feet, and then waited until the mother with her two daughters were about six feet away and I made the shot. Uh, and, and again, this is one of those shots that to, to me, it's a timeless kind of shot. It reminds me of the, look at the way the kids are dressed. I mean, that's how they dress to go to church in the late 50s. Okay. There is yeah. also something yeah. anachronistic about this there, as well. There is. You don't see it. The expression on the little fellow's face in the front is just, you know, it turned out to be this. This is probably probably my favorite photograph. That that the, the, the look in the little kid's eyes, the the mother with her head down. I think that's the father. Follow. I think they had a huge family. I think they'd probably all been to church, and they were yeah. they were all leaving, and there was just such joy in all that. And, and when I saw that thing coming, it was like the radar just. <laughs> Cause you kind of see a photograph getting ready to happen. Like when you, you spend enough time on you the do. street and uh, Jody, um, Jody is asking, and, and I know it doesn't, it, it doesn't influence this particular photograph, but Jody is asking, do you ask people for permission? N Not necessarily, no. but sometimes like the guy with the scooter, you have a conversation with them from, right. I mean, this particular photograph, as Jim just said, it was made kind of off the cuff and he didn't, 
speak with these people at least before the photograph. When you're in a public place, like they're out in a public place and there's no expectation of privacy, then you can take anybody's photograph and you don't have That's to right. have a model release. That's right. right. And, you know, my whole thing is finding regular life moments that, that have something special and look at what's there's so to me there's so much special the, yeah. the way the, the little girls heads are tilted the expressions on their face uh, there, there's there's so much emotion uh, and story in it's this a very natural photograph moment. that uh, and you know I think it uh, it resonates with me because I miss that yeah yeah this goes back to me mentioning earlier that you know I had a worked for a couple of years as a high-rise construction worker when I was young, and uh, there was a it was pouring down rain here in Chicago one day, and there were a couple of guys out. Obviously, you've got the the ball, the ball from the, connected to the crane. They're getting ready to lift uh, the, the, this load of hoses up, and I noticed the, on the right side of the frame this younger guy was taking direction from the guy on the left. And it just reminded me when I was a young guy, uh, how important that is in high rise construction to keep them getting killed. You, know, yeah. you got to pay attention to what's going on. And so that was a, that was a moment that resonated with me. And, you know, if, if, it, if, if that panel, that white panel truck in the lower left of the frame wasn't there, that would be a pretty timeless. I think it's a terrific well. shot. And I also really like the idea. I like seeing the hands. I like his hand, the, the, the the older fella's hand and i i just get this impression that he the young man is learning from the older yeah. one and i there's a context in there now you, to return to jody's question um about asking whether you take before you take photos or not um jim has his own style and i have my own style everybody has their own style you don't have to ask people to take their photograph necessarily but Sometimes having that rapport gets you a better photo or a more interesting photo and sometimes not disturbing the scene gets you the better photo. So there's no absolutes, but I think it's important to not steal a photograph. You yeah, know, that's right. I think yeah, that that's right. sometimes if people don't want to be photographed, don't take their picture. But I think sometimes it makes sense to talk to people. And I do sometimes, and sometimes I don't. So it's a really subjective thing. But I will uh, echo a few things that I've learned over the years about street photography, whether you are a stalker or you sit and wait for the photograph. And I don't mean stalker in a bad way. I mean, chasing the photograph or waiting for it appear to, you, to appear for you. I think that it's very important not to wear polarized sunglasses. It's important to let people see your eyes. It's important to engage with people in some manner. And sometimes it happens, at, sometimes it doesn't happen and that's fine. Sometimes it's after the photograph. Sometimes so it's after the photograph. A, a good smile helps. That's right. And I also carry my photography business cards with me as well. Yeah, yeah, and that's so, a great idea. So if somebody does engage with you, you can say, hey, look, here's my card. If you yeah. would like a copy, of that photograph, send, send me an email yeah. and, and I'll send them a, a copy of the photograph. And Charles is asking, why is asking, why did you not crop, crop the van out? Which is a terrific question. Um, I, I don't know why you didn't, but I well, want to tell you why well, I would. I, I can tell you why I did. Okay. Tell me. If, if I was to, to crop that out, uh, I, I want to maintain the, the two to three ratio Bingo. of the frame. I, and that's what I was going to say. Too much other good stuff comes out of it when you do it. So yeah. It's so not if you so bad that, that's right. If you cut here, then you have to cut, or right. you don't have to. You do whatever you want. Far be it from me. But if you shave that part of the photograph off, in order to maintain this aspect ratio of three over two yeah. or two yeah. over three, you would need to also. Um, and, and you excise could, a certain amount right. of that photograph to keep the aspect ratio the same. That's the most important aspect of cropping. So crop is not a four letter word. If you keep the aspect ratio. If you ratio. crop right. If and you it, crop it, right. And that could yeah. not be cropped into a one by one or a square shot right, either. Right, right. You know, so that, that's the answer. Because you lose, that. yeah, because you lose a little bit of, I was going to say the same thing. I, I, I didn't know, I didn't know if your reason was going to be an artistic one or... Um, or the aspect ratio, and it was the aspect ratio. 
Um, okay. I love right. this. I love this. And now I just want Sarah, we haven't forgotten about your question, but it's a huge question. So we're going to, we're going to get to it. She's that it's huge. If you, if you get any hard ones, just don't look at them. Okay? I won't. No, 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 no. Like if we, any question that's too difficult, right. we're just going to ignore. Act like no, I'm there. just kidding. So this was at the Palmer house and uh, I could see this, this guy smoking a cigarette in front of the Palmer house from quite a distance and made a few photographs before I, I started moving in closer. But I can tell you the things that, and again, even though you've got some modern cars there, but because of the, I shot this with the aperture wide open purposefully for a shallow depth of field, this still has that. To me, it's a cinematic, timeless type of photograph. And this reminded me of scenes that, that I remember from being a little kid. And when, yeah. I, when I was a little kid, everybody, everybody, smoked. everybody smoked. We were and, talking about this last night. Right. The way people smoke, the way they light, the way all of the, all of the that gestures, ritual. They all, they all have yeah. their own style. Everybody, now I've never smoked. I don't encourage anybody to smoke, but I love to take photographs of people smoking because it reminds me, I can remember how my grandfather smoked. I can remember how my mother smoked, my dad. They all did it a different way, my uncles. And, 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 and it was magnificent. They were artistic in the way they would light the cigarette and handle it. And so I said yeah. to this guy, and the other thing, he had a hat on and people wearing hats like this were very common in the late fifties. Not so common anymore. Not so yeah. common anymore. Yeah. And in the late fifties, there were marquees that were lit like that marquee everywhere. Yeah, that's and, right. And so, so this to me was a shot out of the late 1950s. And so I moved closer to get this. And what I did is I opened my aperture up to F2. I set my distance scale up to about three to four feet, hoping that I could creep up on this guy and get this photograph without him seeing me. And so I, I had all that preset on the camera, had my exposure set. And when I walked up, I just pulled the camera to my eye because I really wanted to, to, to nail the frame because there's so much in the, there's a reflections yeah. behind his head. And, and I, I wanted to get this right. I pulled the camera up, made a slight adjustment on the focus, boom, got the shot. Uh, and as soon as I got the shot, he turned and looked at me. And, yeah. I just, and I just grinned at him great big. And I said, man, that was a great shot. I love to take pictures of people smoking. And he was like, right on brother. yeah and that and there you go all good yeah all good sarah asked a terrific question this is the big question that i i want to mention here but sarah i think it's going to take a few more frames for us to really fully discuss this um what advice would you give to someone who's just starting out in street photography and you hinted at this a little bit always carry a camera well, first of all, I would advise you to be careful who you get advice from. <laughs> that would be my first, that's that's the my best. first answer. <laughs> I love it. Be careful who you take advice from. Yeah. Um, I think you got to carry your camera with you all the time, Sarah. Oh, yeah. Even if yeah. your camera, it shouldn't be your phone, I think, even though it's okay, no judges. But cameras start conversations and people will say, is that a real camera? And if you carry your camera, Sarah, and everybody else too, if you carry your camera and you really know how it works and you can make a last second adjustment like Jim did to get this photograph, yeah, so, it becomes an extension of your mind. You know? so, so I did make some notes because I thought somebody's going to ask me what kind of advice would I have for aspiring street photographers. And, yeah. And, the, the very first thing is you've got to be like anything else in life. You've got to be committed to working hard at it because in my opinion, the genre of street photography is the hardest genre of photography there is. I, I, I it's very to, to do really, really good street work is very, very difficult to do because it's a dynamic situation. Yeah. It's not a static. You're not setting up on a tripod to take a picture of a mountain somewhere. And you, right. you go plenty of days where you go out taking pictures. You don't get anything that you know, right? I mean, it's not a surefire thing. Just because right. you go out of your house on the street to take pictures doesn't mean you're going to get something like no, no, this. No. 
or something like the kids coming from church or some of these terrific photographs. I can remember when Craig Sumetko put out Unposed, his first book. Yeah. And that was a compilation of photographs he had taken over 10 years. And, yeah. and by the way, Craig became like a brother to me. And I, you know, without him, I wouldn't be here tonight. But I can remember how much it amazed me when he said it's like, well, yeah, it takes 10 years, Yeah, you know, to come up with. It's like they say 10 years, 10,000 hours, like oh my, that whole thing. Oh my gosh, yeah. Vivian is asking, do you treat your photos? What do you do? What do you, what do you, um, what kind of edits do you yeah, do to your photos? Always a good we question. talked about cropping a little bit. So, so my normal workflow in post-processing uh, is I start out in a Lightroom. Uh, I, I, I try to really minimize what I do in, in Lightroom. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll typically um, adjust the, the, the uh, I want to get a good contrast between the black and white. So I'll adjust the black and white sliders typically a little bit, maybe a little bit of a contrast. If I need to level a little bit, I'll level a little yeah, bit. Yeah, squaring things up. You know? Yeah. Uh, but then I typically go into Silver FX Pro. Uh, when I do my black that's my favorite. I love yeah, that, that that's program. Wonderful. And uh, I've kind of I've kind of created my my own um, little preset, uh, but uh, I, I don't strictly adhere to that. But I I think w when you're showing your your work, uh, it has to have consistency with it. You mm -hmm. know, that's another thing. You know, Craig helped me with that a lot as well because I wasn't good at that, and he you know, he told me how important that was. And I, you know, you catch on. And so, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I use uh, silver effects is just if you're shooting black and white is, is, is and there's a white. color effects pro too, yeah. which is great. I think that now they're made as plugins for Lightroom. I want to, I want to make sure that we're able to, to look at more of your images. I want to just say what I love about this photograph is that all of these lines they all, can you see my mouse? I'm not, I don't know if you can or not, but anyway, all of these. There's a mouse. Yeah. yeah. All of these lines, they're leading the lines on the concrete and the lines in the reflection of the lights are all leading us into the distance, which creates the appearance of this gentleman maybe being a little bit closer than, than, than he actually was. But there's something about the isolation of this and the kind of the emptiness of it. I just think it's a terrific shot. And I, 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 I know why you took this. Well, and you know, Chicago, um, Chicago is about two things to me. It's about the people. And yeah. It's about the architecture, you know, and, and, and the physical aspects of what makes Chicago so special. And so a lot of my photographs will, will, you know, will include both of those aspects. Likewise, I'm crazy about the architecture of this town. And in fact, I take a lot more pictures of architecture than I do of people. This is terrific. This is on the cover of, of Jim's book, Second Look. Um, what a great little picture. Again, childhood, not the, just the child. I yeah. mean, the kind of weird face he's making. And I get the sense, I'm almost certain I, I, that he's got his head up against that bar. Yeah, it's, like it's just a very, and he's kind of got his face pressed up against the window. Um, a moment, not a stock, right? That's a That's moment right. you came That's across right. and you snapped the picture. Well, when I, again, when I saw that moment, it was, my mind just kind of takes me back in time. It's yeah. like, I remember being a little boy. I remember being on a bus. I remember smooching my face up against the window. Yep. And, and so, you know, I kept my eye on, I, I kept my eye on him waiting for something special to happen. Yeah. Yet not, not getting his attention. So, you know, when he looked away and had his face smooched up like that, yeah, that, that to me just tells a story. Who doesn't? Yeah. Who doesn't remember being a little kid? We all sitting on a bus, looking out a window, daydreaming about something. That's what that moment had to say. Plus, I like the I like the horse strong. Yeah, horizontal the strong things. horizontals. Yeah. yeah, and Sarah, this is this part capturing moments like this and triggering triggering your subconscious in that moment to make that picture comes from carrying a camera knowing the gear getting it set up and that is what i mean by that is when you go outdoors adjusting your iso appropriately and getting the camera ready to go and not having to do that thing where you're messing around because the moment will be gone um and so the other, I'd like to offer Sarah some other advice and everybody some advice. And I'm not trying to sell books when I say this. 
buy photography books. Look Absolutely. at other photographers and see what they do and enjoy them. And if you get a chance to talk to the photographer, as we have the benefit of doing tonight, you can learn a little bit about the impetus behind the images. The Chicago, this is great. I love this picture. Um, it's got structure. It's got some motion because we're going to assume the train is actually moving. You used a relatively fast shutter speed to stop the action. I love it that all of that inky darkness in the bottom and the angle of, of moving from the lower left to the upper right gives this sense of, 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 of motion. I chose this picture because it's distinctly Chicago. It is. And because it's one of the few yeah. that doesn't have people in it. It is. When I look at that photograph, I hear, I hear that train. Yeah. And if you've yeah. ever been in Chicago, you know exactly what I'm saying, right? It, it's I, loud. I, I hear that. I look at that picture and I hear it. I also, you know? I also chose this picture as just a moment because we're coming towards the end of our time here today. Uh, but I chose this also because it's kind of like a palate cleanser before we get into just quickly some of your color, color work. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I think it's terrific. And in honor of Ernst Haas would have turned 102 today. I want to show you in America, take a look at this picture and the reflections in it, right? So I've already compared you to Robert Frank. Now I'm now Ernst to right now. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, Arthur Meyerson, as I mentioned earlier, uh, gave me the courage to, to, to branch out as a black and white photographer to have the guts to, to try to go out and do color work and, you know, explain to me, look, Jim, black and white is one language and color is another language, okay? And you, you know black and white, but color's tough. And yeah. one of the, the cool things about Like Academy events is the instructors who, you know, many of them are great photographers known worldwide, are not going to sugarcoat things and they're they're not going to treat you with kid gloves they they assume you're coming there with the intent of becoming a better photographer um yeah the, the other the other neat thing is is um uh, and, and i you know can't quite understand why but but these these photographers that are known all over the world have gone out of their way to to, to remain friends of mine to stay in touch with me to encourage me uh, the, the photography community is something I never anticipated would, would become like mm. another family to me. It's a big, small community. And yeah. so we, and so we encourage you and urge you to keep connected here. Um, and I, I will send an email once this video production is up on YouTube. And so you'll have my email address, which you probably have from earlier today, but we can stay in touch and we're all about making these connections. That's one of the things that I think has taught me miles and miles and miles of stuff about my own photography was going to academies, going to academies, taking classes and learning, talking to other photographers and looking at books. Yeah, yeah. I think that each of those things, I hate to move too quickly through your photographs because well, uh, uh, they're fabulous, well, but. So, so black and white, interestingly is an abstraction because reality is in color mm -hmm. and so black and white is an abstraction but yet for me in taking photographs black and white is reality color i have found which is actually reality but for me when i'm taking color photographs they tend to be abstract because color is an abstraction for me hmm. when i'm doing photography huh. it's kind of a role reversal if you understand what i'm saying so Suddenly, when I was trying to find my legs in color photography, it dawned on me, I tend to shoot these abstract scenes. And the first two you've seen here, have, I think you can see what I'm talking This is Club Lago here, one of Dan and I's favorite spots in Chicago. Love this and then the next one, I think, is the, the, the yellow tape. So, I was walking, walking along, I might've been Dearborn street here in Chicago. And, and I, I looked in to take a picture of this empty cafe, uh, with that salt shaker on that yellow table. All of a sudden I realized that yellow bollard was reflecting in the mm -hmm. window and it's like, holy smokes, that is so surreal. And, and I think that photograph is, I, 
So I post my photographs on Flickr um, and Instagram and Facebook on, on uh, Flickr. I think that's had 25,000 views in a relatively short I period of time. I love this picture. And let's, let me note something, kind of like the, uh, the last black and white we saw. We, it's a st relatively static image and there's no people in it. And, you know, people used to say to Ansel Adams, how come you don't have any people in your picture? And he would say, well, there's always two people. I created yeah, the photograph right. and you're watching it. So don't be afraid to take pictures that are, that don't have people that can still be street photography. There's no, there really are no rules in, in, a, in a lot of, in a lot of ways. I'm crazy about this photograph. And as soon as you showed it to me, I fell in love with it. This, well, this was Cuba. Yeah. So and we've traveled together a number of times. And one of the trips that we took was Cuba, which is a magical place in a lot of ways for a lot of reasons. But one of them is it's a terrific photographic journey. So if you get the chance, please do go. Um, and we had two classic cars that we were in. And yeah. me and Susan and Narayan, so a bunch of All people right. were in one and you guys were in the other. So and there's so there, there's a lot in this. I mean, you could look in the rear view mirror and you can see the face of the driver and the face of our good friend Keith riding in the shotgun. Then the back, you can see me and a couple of our other, the owners uh, sitting there with me as well. And then you can also see out the rear window of the car. You can see out the windshield. So there's, yeah, there's a zillion things to look at. And plus it was just the color of, uh, you know, the car, his shirt, the, the, the whole bit. So. Nice echoes, nice echoes of these soft arch shapes, which are everywhere. I don't know if you folks can see what I'm pointing at with my mouse, but there's the, these soft, kind of soft archy things are everywhere. They're down in the grill, they're in the visors, they're in the ceiling of the car, they're even at the window at left. And of course, in the window, the rear view mirror, these kind and, of subtle arcs. And the other point is don't ever quit looking. Yeah. Don't ever quit looking. You know, that's the thing. I think too many photographers, you know, they, if they're riding from point A to B, they, while they're taking the ride from point A to B, they quit looking and they take the ride and they miss everything yeah. that happened along the ride or whatever. That's you, right. You, you always have that's to right. be looking. Yeah. Um, Jim, what are some of your favorite, what are you, some of your favorite books? Well, the, you know, I look a lot at Elliot Erwitt's work, mm -hmm. obviously, Robert Frank, The Americans, uh, Craig Sometko's book, um, a couple of Hoosiers that uh, you should know, Peter and David Turner. Oh, uh, yes. yeah. Well, we're going to put links in when we communicate with you afterward and this video goes up on YouTube. We'll connect you with these names and I'll, we'll put some links. Ernst Haas, Saul Leiter, you know, big influence. Who are Saul. the Hoosiers? The Turnley brothers. The Turnley brothers, the identical twins, the greatest photojournalist probably in, in ever. And they're sweethearts. Uh, you know, this yeah. is, Jim said something earlier and I want to echo it. It's a little bit like being a musician or being an actor or being a dancer or another artist of some type or stripe is that we all love connecting with one another there's no competition well, what people will do i'll give you a quick example so peter turnley and i have communicated by by email uh, mm -hmm. uh, periodically and uh, maybe six months or so ago there was a zoom meeting much like this zoom meeting and dan i think you were on it yeah uh, Peter was given a talk and there were people from all over the world on this Zoom meeting. He was able to look uh, as he in ended his Zoom presentation and there were, I don't know, a couple of hundred people oh, yeah. on, on the on the Zoom. He happens to spot my face uh, on, on the uh, in the window in, in of Zoom. Thumbnail, and he says, wait a minute, let's stop here. I want to do a special uh, hello to, to Jim Rice. And I thought, holy smoke. And I can see the looks. It's flattering. Well, yeah. But but a guy like that, that's known all the world, doesn't have to do that. Right. But, but that kind of kindness with, I talked about how much Craig has done for me, Arthur yeah. Myerson, Peter Turnley, you know, it, it's a wonderful family that will do things for you that you can't imagine they'll do. You just have to make yourself available. You know, go, that's right. Go meet these people go take a class with them develop a relationship with them it's it's spectacular and we happen to be mentioning we happen to be mentioning a lot of male 
It's all the oh, Vivian photographers. Meyer. Vivian, Vivian Meyer. Vivian Meyer. Is a, yeah, so yeah. I, I, I don't, I, I, we, there's not enough time in a little zoom to, to include everybody, but I want to, I want, I really want to drive home this idea that we are all family and we're all together. You don't have to be a, like a person. You don't have to be a street photographer. You'd be anything, please connect, connect, connect with other photographers and other people who are either supporting your art or supporting your vision or just you like to be around. I mean, that's one of the best things, well, you know? You, you know, every day that there, I spend time looking at people's work. Uh, Joseph Michael Lopez, I took a Like Academy class with him. I love his work. I, uh, Sally Davies is a great mm. photographer in New York City. You, you She's should, fabulous. You should look at her work. Uh, you, you know, Phil Penman does a great job. Alan Schaller. But but likewise, there there are people just like you and me. A lot of you that are watching this Zoom tonight, uh, you probably picked up that I don't have a British accent like Phil Penman or Alan Schauer, and and that I'm not a known <laughs> that I'm not a known name. Okay, yet. But but I'm a lot like you. Yeah, that's and, right. And and you know, don't think that if 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 you're willing to put in the work and you know, it's not like, I mean, I've spent 15 years up here on the streets to get a few good photographs. I, I mean, it, it takes a long, long time and a lot of patience, but there is a wonderful, the Leica is so much more than a camera. A lot of people don't realize that. Leica is so much more than a camera. I mean, they created an additional family for me that I never had before. And some of the people mm -hmm. I thank, like Tom Smith at the start and Matt, uh, you know, and Jim Wagner, you know, those guys don't need to give me the time of day, but they treated me like, you know, like, like I'm something special. And uh, it isn't just me. They, they, they do that for everybody. That's, it's true. So avail yourself of that opportunity. And if, and if any of you have any questions about anything you have heard or seen here tonight, please um, write the complaint department at, no, just send me an email, let me know, because I want to keep people connected. I want to keep people in the know and we want to grow this family. So please do not be shy. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As if you haven't seen enough of our smiling faces, I thought I would give you one more look. <laughs> but as we're winding down, and thank you to all my Julia. Thank you. Friends. Thank you for I, jumping on board here, and my colleagues at HWC. Yeah, thank you so much to all the all the uh, new fa like a family members that were not otherwise photographers. Thank you for joining us, and Julia. I'm so thrilled that you're here. Last year we didn't connect. This year we will. We're thrilled to have you. Thrilled to have you. Um, we have more stuff coming up. So any of you who did not get an email about this, please uh, let me know or mark your calendars. Two weeks from today, we're going to do another artist talk with uh, Mark DePaola, who uses a, a lot of vintage lenses. And we're going to talk specifically about the gear, he and I. So this is going to be a little bit more on the equipment side and a little less on the process side. Uh, but please do join us. You can find it on Eventbrite. Um, and it, like today's, uh, this evening's talk, it's completely free. We encourage everybody to join. Unfortunately, we can only have up to about 300 people on one of these meetings, but we'd have thousands if we could. And then as we wind down and do some more thank yous, I want to show you once again, um, this is how to find each and every one of us. Of course, if you don't have a pen with you right now, or perhaps you have already gone off to enjoy your dinner or your evening, um, uh, uh, and you missed this, please do send an email and we'll get everybody connected. You can follow us on Instagram, uh, follow Leica Camera, take a Leica Academy if you get the opportunity. We have a number of them coming up here in Chicago, um, but they're done all over the world and we recommend them very highly. It's a great place. A lot of camaraderie, uh, the opportunity to use the latest and greatest gear, and you'll meet people like some of these names that we've mentioned. Um, uh, the director of the Leica Academy, Tom Smith, is an amazingly knowledgeable and nurturing person, as are many of the Leica people um, and a lot of the photographers you're going to um, 
uh, you're going to, you're going to meet, uh, along the way. So we hope that you continue to stay in touch and we hope that you, uh, will join us again for another talk. And so please do stay in touch with us. And I'm going to, um, end by thanking Jim. Thanks, well, man. Thank you very much. Yeah. You may never see me again, but if you do, I hope you do. And it's, been, I hope so. it's been awesome to be here. Thanks to you, Dan, and everybody at Leica. I never dreamed I'd sit with you for an hour <laughs> like this, but it's been, it's been awesome. I'm so glad to hear it. We could talk for hours, but we won't bore you. Uh, we, maybe we'll, we'll come back and we'll do another one in a, uh, in a couple of months, uh, a second one. But anyway, if you receive our emails, terrific. Please engage. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook and all these other places. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again for joining us this evening.